11th P.K. Gopalakrishnan Memorial Lecture. And I will first introduce the lecture series and then, of course, the distinguished speaker for the day, Dr. Chinmay Tube. Uh, P.K. Gopalakrishnan, as we know, was an important administrator and also an academician. Uh, he was born in 1923, graduated from the Maharaja's College in Anaklam, and then followed, followed it with a master's degree in economics from uh, Lucknow University, and then, of course, did a second master's degree in social sciences from the in, uh, Institute for Social Studies at The Hague in the Netherlands. And thereafter, he went on to do a PhD in economics under uh, a very famous economist um, and, uh, uh, and uh, Professor Jan Tinbergen, who, as you know, was one of the first persons to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Okay. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, uh, Dr. Pika Gopalakrishnan completed his PhD in two years. And then he returned and joined the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta, and that was in 1954. There he worked for some time, and then he returned to his home state, Kerala, in 1960 and uh, became the director of the Bureau of Economics and Statistics, where he worked for uh, quite some time, and uh, before joining as the first member secretary of the Kerala State Planning Board in 1972. Okay. And that position he held for almost like eight years, and then, he, of course, he became also the special secretary to the planning and economic affairs uh, department of the Kerala state. Now, Pro uh, Dr. Pika Kobalakrishnan was one of the persons who was instrumental in establishing the Center for Development Studies. And uh, from the government side, he did a lot of help. And in fact, if one were to look at uh, his contribution to the state, uh, two things stand out. And both these were innovations were or for the innovations in governance uh, for the first time happening at the state level. First is the formulation of a science and technology policy at the state level. In fact, Kerala was the first state in the uh, Indian Union to have a technology policy at the state level, which led to the setting up of an institutional framework for uh, implementing that policy in the form of the Kerala State Council for Science, Technology and Environment. Okay, and second is the establishment of a number of uh, research institutes to support public policy making, and one of which was uh, was the Center for Development Studies. In fact, he was very helpful, uh, as I can see, as a member of the uh, uh, our uh, first governing board, uh, very helpful in establishing the center and also granting it a kind of a special autonomy, which I'm very proud to say that we enjoy even now. Okay. So we are extremely grateful to the family of uh, Dr. P.K. Kovalakrishnan to establish this endowment in our center. And we have been using this endowment essentially to conduct these lecture series. Now, uh, for doing the 11th lecture series, we have invited uh, Dr. Chinmay Tumpe, who is currently a member of the Faculty of Economics at the uh, Indian Institute of Management, Hamdabad. Dr. Thumbe has actually done his uh, uh, studies at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and then at the London School of Economics. And he was in 2013, the Shan Monet uh, uh, Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. And then subsequently, he was the uh, Alfred D. Chandler Jr. Uh, visiting scholar, international visiting scholar in business history at Harvard Business School. And he has published two books quite recently. Both books are actually on migration. And uh, the first book is called India Moving, A History of Migration. It was published in 2018. And I believe it is published by Penguin. Okay. And the second book was published quite recently, just last year. And it is called The Age of Pandemics, 1817 to 1920, How They Shaped India and the World. And this was published by HarperCollins. Okay. And of course, uh, 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 Dr. Thumbe is very, very uh, prolific in his writing uh, in uh, journal articles, newspaper articles. He has a number of YouTube videos if you uh, search for him. And, and he was also a member of the Lancet COVID-19 India Task Force. And as a member, I believe he has just completed a large paper uh, measuring the, the uh, mortality due to COVID-19 in India. Okay. And he has also worked in the working group on migration and of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Elevation in 2016-17, and has helped to set up the IIMA archives also. 
Okay, so Dr. Tumpe, a very warm welcome to the Center for Development Studies. We are very privileged to have you here, and we look forward to your lecture on migration and pandemics. And as I said before, uh, you could take about an hour or so, and then uh, allow some questions and answers from the floor. Great, thank you so much, Professor Sunil. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here at CDS. I would have loved to be there in person, but this we live in the age of a new pandemic. Uh, and unfortunately, we have to meet like this online. Um, it's a tremendous privilege to be giving this lecture. Uh, I was just having a list, look at the you know people who gave this lecture in the previous years, and um, it's it's really humbling to have this invitation. Uh, I should also say, uh, you know, uh, I think the family of uh, the late P P P K Gopal Krishnan is also here, so I ex uh, extend uh, my thank you to you. Uh, and of course, to CDS, uh, an institution I've never been a part of as a student or faculty, but remarkably has been an institution which has touched me in various ways. Uh, I was uh, a young PhD student more than 10 years back, uh, rummaging through the library, the one wonderful library at CDS. When I chanced upon, I was looking for postal money order data, uh, uh, and I was looking for annual reports of the post office of say 1990, 1985 and so on. And the shelf on the CDS library had all the annual reports of the post office going back not only to 1980, but to unbelievably 1880. Uh, and that completely shifted my PhD course and trajectory later on, realizing that history is so important and many of the things we take for granted uh, have happened before. Uh, the other way, of course, CDS is connected is my interest in economic history which uh, really comes from uh, you know, uh, some courses I took under Dr. Tirthankar Roy at the LSE. And as some of you know, Dr. Tirthankar Roy did his PhD at CDS. So in two very fundamental ways, uh, you know, CDS has actually uh, uh, shifted in a way my research trajectory, first uh, onto migration and then uh, very specifically onto migration and then into research. And of course, when Professor Irudhya Rajan was there, there were a lot of workshops held on migration and a lot, a lot of the young scholars in India got a lot of motivation from that. And CDS uh, is, is really the, the hub of migration research for the last 20 years. So for me to talk on migration and pandemics here is really like a cricketer going to Lords and playing cricket. It's, it's like the Mecca of you know, that place. Uh, and so CDS is really the, has been the hub for migration research. And I'm so happy to be presenting some of my work out here. So with that, I'm going to start off my presentation. I will assume that you can see this. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about migration and pandemics. And as you can see, as Dr. Sunil mentioned, you know, I've written two books. One is on migration, calling India moving, and the other is on pandemics, the age of pandemics. And of course, a common theme running across these books is migration. Uh, is there something we can learn from past episodes of pandemics? Were things handled well this time around? Could things have handled be different? And most importantly, what do we really learn from not only the past, but our immediate past, that is the last one and a half years, to set ourselves in a good position in the year down the line, but more importantly, in the pandemics of the future? Because even if COVID ends, you know, we will be exposed to pandemics going down the line, and we clearly do not want to be making the same mistakes again. I'll start off with the most important, you know, feature of this pandemic when it first hit India last year was that before we got the mortality crisis, we got a migration crisis. And this is an image taken from the photojournalist Danish Siddiqui, uh, uh, who unfortunately passed away a few months back in Afghanistan while reporting in Afghanistan. And it's one of the shocking images and visuals that we got, unfortunately got to see from our homes. Uh, just as middle class India was watching the Ramayana replay on TV, real life Indians were being pushed out, literally out of our cities, uh, back home, uh, walking. Many of them walked back home, some of them on cycles. And the special trains, the shramic trains, in a way, came you know, two months late, which is in the month of May. Now, what's interesting for me, as a person who works on migration, demography, economics, history, and so on, is that this has happened in the past as well. And so this image that you're seeing now on your screen shows you and as, as, as images go, a, a very, very similar scene from more than 100 years back on the platforms of Bombay Railway Station. Uh, it's called the Pandemic Plague in India, the Exodus from Bombay. And this was drawn in February 1897. And I want you to just look at these two images 
because there is the same sense of utter desperation in both the images. These are images taken more than a hundred years apart, and yet the same sense of you know uh, a desperation. You can see the woman holding the child on one side. You can see the man holding the child on the other side. There is a sense of you know let us leave this place and go back. Right. The difference, of course, is that on one side you see the train. And on the other side, you don't see a train. And that's a huge part of you know, what went wrong, in my view, uh, last year. But my larger point to make out here is that is there really, if, if these visuals have played out in the past as well, what were the policy trade-offs happening back then? And is there something we could have learned you know, in, say, March 2020? And of course, is there any learning going ahead as well? So I'm going to start this discussion with this, these two images, just to give you a sense of the challenges that a pandemic throws up, and also the patterns of successive pandemics which it throws up. Because I, one, of, one of the things I want to kind of, you know, hopefully uh, point out here is the repetition of patterns. And that is why pandemic management, a lot of it, as you know, in the last one and a half years, people are groping in the dark because we still don't know so much about this disease. But a lot of it is also happened in the past. And we need to be buck ourselves by learning that. For example, think of pandemic death progression, which is another important thing we see. This is the reported numbers. I'm going to talk a lot about death numbers at the end of this presentation. But this is the reported COVID deaths until, say, July. You know, uh, and you'll see the, these two waves. There was a lot of complacency. You know, after the first All India wave, roughly, if, if I remember correctly, January, February, March, a sense of complacency had set in in India as if the pandemic is over. And I see a lot of that complacency even now. Uh, what we learned from past pandemics, whether it was cholera, whether it was plague, or whether it was influenza, is that pandemics come in waves. And especially when you're dealing with migrant workers, this is not a one-off event. You have to really set yourself up to dealing with migration because migration is such a central part of pandemics over and over again. And so in this presentation, I'm gonna give you snapshots of what happened in the past also in these three pandemics, which form the core of my book, Cholera, Plague, and Influenza. And you'll see these are all you know, quantitative metrics coming from India's death statistics. The cholera you know, figures, death rates are fairly high in the late 19th century. They start to diminish after 1920s as better prevention and cure is found. Plague fizzles out, most likely due to herd immunity among rodents. 1907 is a peak year of plague in India where over a million deaths happen. And influenza is a shorter lived pandemic but really, it knocks off so many Indians that you know the mortality is extremely, extremely high. The reason I'm putting all these four pandemic prog death progression charts on one page is to show you how different pandemics, how long they can last, and how these waves can look like. Right? And of course, influenza being a virus is the most similar when we think about coronavirus, cholera and plague being bacteria-based disease. But cholera lasted in some severity for a century, plague for 25 years, influenza for about a year and a bit, and COVID in India is, as of now, ongoing. Of course, there's been a lot of exposure to the virus, plus the vaccination progress in the last two months has been quite terrific. Right? But the, the idea being that pandemics come in waves. I mean, you think about migration, you can't think of a one-off approach. You really have to set yourself up for many, many months, if not years, down the line. So the age of pandemics was very costly in terms of lives in India. Overall, I estimate that 70 million people died between 1817 and 1920. That, to give you a sense of how large that number 70 million is, it is more than the people who died in World War I and World War II put together. And one of the things I argue in my book is, you know, imagine writing the history of the 20th century without writing the history of World War I and World War II. It's impossible. But you can write the history of this period, as many people have done, without at all mentioning these deadly pandemics. But what's most striking is that India was the most affected country in absolute terms in each of those three pandemics, losing totally about 40 million people. And the worst affected was in influenza, when in a short period of time, India lost, by my estimates as well as others, in the range of 15 to 20 million people. My estimate is 20 million people. 20 million people died in 1918-20 pandemic in India. That was about 6% of India's population it is in a way one of the world's greatest demographic disasters and remarkably never really written about in our history, right? So it is one thing, I'm, I'm pointing this out because 
when COVID struck last year, and one of the reasons I wrote this book was a remarkable collective amnesia about just how badly India has suffered in the past pandemics. And I believe that collective amnesia is also explains partly as to why India suffered so much again in this pandemic. So if you look at the numbers in COVID right now, the reported COVID-19 deaths global total as of today is about 5 million, of which India, the government of India tells us the overall official number is about half a million, about 450,000 deaths if you look at the newspapers today. That is not what the excess mortality estimates tell us. Those numbers now place global mortality closer to 15 million. I put 10 million plus out here. And India, as our estimates, various other studies are now showing, is about 3 million people, which means India is the most affected country in terms of absolute deaths in this pandemic. And even on per capita terms, India is now, unfortunately, among the high rise. Right? So, Four pandemics that you're seeing in this chart, cholera, plague, influenza, and COVID. And in all of them, unfortunately, India has been number one in terms of absolute deaths. Now, this is shocking. It should shock us that, you know, why is it that uh, we, are, we are so hard stricken by these pandemics? Of course, there have been pandemics in between. We had the 1957, 1968, 69 flus. We had AIDS as a pandemic. We had SARS, MERS, and so on, and India was less affected in those pandemics. But these were the deadly ones, right? Of course, AIDS was also deadly, and that disproportionately in Sub-Saharan Africa. But these, and the last major viral one, of course, was in 1918. Right. This has also an economic connotation. That is, pandemics seem to knock out the Indian economy. The two worst years of macroeconomic, in terms of macroeconomy in Indian history, are interestingly both 1918 and 2020. And when I was an economic student, you know, uh, learning economics for almost 10 years of my life, I never once came across pandemics in any course on the Indian economy and so on, right? Which is striking when you think about it. I learned about the Great Depression, what happened in the US, more than what happened in India, but I never learned about pandemics. 1918, influenza, economy contracted by 10%, inflation of 30%, massive supply side shock that year. Last year, Contraction about minus 8%, inflation down about 5 or 6%. Right? So you see this chart, x-axis GDP growth rate, y-axis inflation, and you realize that the two worst years of Indian economic history have both been pandemic years, which also tells you how important economists need to be paying attention to pandemics. So here's a framework to understand this whole lives versus livelihoods debate, which is at the core of understanding eventually what we're trying to understand, that is migration. How do migrant workers get affected? And there are undoubtedly very, very difficult policy choices to make. So let's have a look at this. The y-axis here is GDP loss percent. That is how much is your output affected by. And the x-axis here is COVID deaths per million people. So the y-axis in a way is livelihoods, some proxy, crude proxy, and the x-axis is lives, right? And so if you look at this you know, triad, it's basically saying if you shut down your economy completely, especially from international interactions like say Australia and New Zealand, you might get some GDP loss, but you also save on debts. Of course, if you just let your economy completely open, let the virus burn through the population, you'll end up with a lot of debts, but maybe not so much of a GDP loss. I would argue, of course, that I'm going to end this presentation by saying that this neat kind of a, a, a trade-off actually is not, I mean, you have to think through these trade-offs carefully. It's an attractive first-off presentation, but you know we're, we're going to end this presentation by saying that if you just leave your economy completely open, uh, your economy will also crash. Right? So this is not what I'm advocating. This is what I'm just presenting as a possible thing. Now, the other quadrants, less GDP loss, less debts. What's interesting in this framework is, is it good policy or is it good luck? You know, have you just lucked out for some reason that this is not affecting? For example, India in 2020, a lot of people said, yes, we lost a lot of output, but hey, we were not having so many debts as, per com as compared to the West. And so a lot of people said this was good policy. Of course, a lot of people said it's good. Now move to as we stand today in September, India has one of the slowest growth rates if you look at the 2021 period combined. And it has, one, it has very high excess mortality per capita. So not the reported numbers, but the excess mortality. We're saying about 2,000 per million. That's in the range of US, UK, and pretty much Latin American countries, though of course there are some countries much worse affected than India in mortality. And so India today is squarely on that quadrant that you're seeing 
that is bad policy or bad law. And depending on your political view, you're going to choose that thing. So if you're a pro, you know, government, uh, government I'm, I'm talking across political party lines, you know, if, if you think that your state government or your union government has done a good job, you're going to say, and if you believe in that government, you'll say this is because of bad luck. That is, we are in this mess because of the Delta variant, and the Delta variant was unusually bad for us, and that's bad luck. And we tried our best, but things didn't work out. Or if you're in the opposition, you're going to make a lot of noise and say, this is not bad luck, this is bad policy, we could have done much better. Right? And of course, my position is that it's a bit of both. India, of course, however well we might have done in policy, the, the Delta variant is sweeping through countries across the world. And obviously, there's an element of just pure bad luck as to how the Delta variant especially broke out in India this year. But there's no doubt, as I'm going to point out, that especially when it comes to migration, there were some seriously bad choices made. And we need to learn from those lessons going forward. Uh, lockdowns, I just you know, point out some of the evidence emerging on lockdowns in, in general. Uh, this is from the Azim Premji University uh, you know, uh, report. Lockdowns disproportionately affect the poor. This is a maxim that we should keep in mind before we do lockdowns. It's a, it's a very important chart out here that is percentage change in income. And you see how the poorest deciles basically have much sharper drops. This is after the you know, lockdown announced last year. It should also be, you know, this is a very complicated table, but it's basically somebody's estimate about what percentage of jobs in each sector can be done from home. And the key takeaway from this is that most workers in India cannot work from home. It's obvious, but it needs to be said out here because this lecture is some sort of a work being done and it's being done, you know, I'm sitting in Ahmedabad, you're sitting across India and we're still having this task done. But for the bulk of the sectors in India, think of manufacturing, et cetera, if you look at that, you know, column four in this table, the only sectors where a lot of stuff can be done from home is education. Education, 68% of jobs in education sector can be done from home, right? So that's probably the biggest number. And in IT, information communication is 62%, real estate, 47%. But agriculture, only 5% and so on, right? So obviously there's sectoral differences in what part of work can be done from home. And obviously the pandemic has hit those sectors most in which people have not been able to work from. Just to give you a sense of where we stand as of today, this is a chart on the worst demographic disasters of India, 20 million deaths influenza, and it starts at about two to three million from the Bengal famine. When we say that about three million people are dead today in India due to the pandemic, and I say this based on our study, which is the Deshmukh et al. study in this chart on the right, but you'll see in this chart, there are about five or six studies now which have estimated all India mortality. Um, Christoph Guilmoto, many of you will know, famous demographer, has an estimate of 2.2 million, but that's a very, very, uh, it's, it's not taking the full amount of May and June data, so that, and that, that had peak mortality. Uh, there's some other works based on civil registration studies. Our work looks at civil registration, HMIs, health manage, management information systems, and the only survey in India, the Seawater Survey, which asked a question on pandemic deaths throughout the tenure of the pandemic. Right? And it's on basis of these three surveys that we estimate now about 2.7 to 3.4, roughly 3 million people to have died in the pandemic and not 450,000. That makes COVID-19 pandemic the worst demographic shock in their space since the 1940s. I'm putting this out there because it's important to know how badly we've been hit in terms of the economy. Uh, you've seen the GDP declines and so on, uh, and also in terms of demographic shock. Right? And this is not just about the second wave. You know, Angus Deaton had a paper, Nobel Prize winning economist Angus Deaton had a paper in 2021 with data up to December 2020. And he showed that India was even then, I mean, if you look at that chart, even then, if you looked at comparison of 200 countries in the world, India was not doing too well on reported debts per capita in relative terms, remember, uh, or for that matter in GDP growth. And we had one of the worst GDP falls in 2020 because of an extremely, extremely harsh lockdown. So with that kind of an introduction, I'm now going to move on to, you know, what do we learn from the past? And I'm going to kind of give you images from the past and, you know, have some things highlighted in red font bold as to some of the things. And some of them, I think, might strike you as being very prescient. That is, if only we knew this, you know, we might have thought about some of our policy choices very differently. So first is to state the obvious. When cholera broke out in 1817 to 19, it took a long time for cholera to go around India and then eventually around the world. 
Right? We live in a time where diseases can spread extremely fast. In this map, cholera breaks out in eastern India around Jessore, Cal Calcutta in August 1817. And it takes one and a half years for cholera to reach Sri Lanka or Ceylon or to that matter Tamil Nadu. Right? Which means basically we're saying diseases in the early 19th century in the absence of the railways, absence of airways, absence of steamboats took time. Right? And so obviously pandemics have amplified, have kind of, you know, the speed of pandemics in which can overwhelm a population has dramatically altered over the next, you know, 200 years, because today we live in a hyper-connected world. And so a disease outbreak in Wuhan can, you know, suddenly spread across the world in no time, right? So one has to be, so the response time to pandemics has shrunk tremendous, right, from about 200 years back. But one of the most stylized facts of pandemics is that there is migrant flight from cities. It is a stylized, virtually every major pandemic of the past has seen migrant flight from its cities. But this is an image, it's a cartoon from, the, from America, USA, which was hit by cholera particularly hard in 1832, 1849, and 1866. And as you can see, this you know, skull basically says, you'll have to come down with your rents. I intend to occupy these premises myself. Right. Why? It, it, it's, it's showing you two things. It's showing you the impact on migration, that is, people have left. And because people have left, urban rents have gone down. It's also pointing out to the real estate impact of the pandemic. Right. Now, migrant flight. So what does this tell us? That migrant flight is one of the most stylized facts of pandemics, whether it's in US, UK, you know, China, India. I'm going to talk about India, China in a bit. What it tells us, essentially, is that you have to, as, as a policymaker, you have to anticipate this. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep coming back to the decisions we made, especially in March 2020, that uh, migration and migrant workers was nowhere in the ambit, for example, when the lock, national lockdown was announced and so on. Uh, and uh, you know, this was a clear something which should have come. It should be in any pandemic management manual that you have to look at what happens to migrant workers. Right now, I'll, I'll come. I'll kind of you know, build on to this more in, in the coming slides as to how exactly people go back, what do they do, how do they come back, and so on. The other thing we learned from the past is this whole thing about quarantines. Right? Pandemics of the past, this is an image from Russia. Russia was a country, by the way, hugely affected by cholera. The famous composer, music composer Tchaikovsky, also died of cholera. Uh, so did his mother, by the way. Uh, and uh, it's an image which shows you many things. It shows you the kind of social distancing. You know, it, uh, you can see people uh, at a distance from each other and so on. Uh, but it also shows you a world in which quarantines were the norm. You know, this whole debate about lockdowns, restrictions that happened in the past, business lobbies were anti-quarantine, anti-lockdowns, health officials were pro-lockdown, pro-quarantine. These debates have played over and over and over again. Uh, what we learned from the 19th century world is that those quarantines were not only, they, they, they were definitely effective in many cases in, in checking disease, but the way in which they were implemented gave a lot of power to the ruling authorities. Right? Think about our own Epidemic Disease Act. It was implemented in 1897 in, during the year of the plague. You know, we're using the same legislation today that was, uh, was constructed to handle the plague. And a lot of these sweeping powers that are given, uh, you know, often can discriminate against workers. But because we're talking about migration, it comes extremely hard down on migrant workers in particular, right? And that's one of the reasons, of course, uh, why migrant workers suffered a lot in 20. Another aspect of mobility in India, which is very relevant, is pilgrimages, right? And uh, we've, we've had so much of discussion in the last one and a half years on religion and pandemics, festivals and pandemics. I'm sure many of you are based in Kerala. Kerala got a lot of flack for holding some festivals recently and so on. But the, the, the festival or the, the, the Mela, which got the biggest flag this year was the Kumbha Mela. And what we learned from the past is many things. Uh, this is a chart showing you Kumbha fairs and cholera, which you know people showed had a clear linkage in years of the Kumbha Mela, you know, cholera, which is the waterborne uh, disease uh, clearly spread out and so on. Again, you know, there is a huge literature on in Indian history on Kumbha Mela fairs, pilgrimages, and diseases. And there is absolutely no doubt that these you know, festivals are potential spreaders of diseases and one has to think cautiously go through. And I found tons of evidence, the Maharaja of Kulapur shutting down a particular festival in a particular year 
and people respecting it. The whole point is about a social contract with the people. If you can convey to people, you know, the, that the fact that we don't, that people's lives are more important than the festival or the event that year, things might be different. This year, of course, it was very unfortunate and it came from a certain sense of hubris that the pandemic is over, that we went ahead with the Kumbh Mela, we went ahead with a lot of events which otherwise should simply should not have done. What history tells us is that and in, in India, pilgrimages have been shut down in key pandemic years. Interestingly, in the Kumbh, believe it or not, just like we're talking about vaccine certificates and so on, in the 1930s, for, for a brief period, you required to show you were required to show a cholera vaccination certificate before embarking on the Kumbh Mela pilgrimage. Can you believe that? Right. So we've had public health responses in the past as well, which have basically men which have managed mobility and keeping you know public health at, 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 at a very core focus in the past as well. Right. Of course, the Indian response back then was saying, you know, we we want these festivals. Of course, how can you curtail these festivals? But why don't we make adequate arrangements? The British at that time, you know, did not were not too enthused to make those arrangements. That's a separate side story. But this idea that in India pilgrimages, pil pilgrimages in the past have spread diseases, you know, uh, definitely show has some merit. Uh, there is also discrimination in a pandemic, and I would argue that migrants are often targeted. Uh, among the class of super spreaders in history, you know, in plague, the, you had migrants, you had soldiers, you had uh, uh, tailors because the rat fleas were tucked into clothes. Human beings generally are looking for reasons to attribute their general you know, calamities. Uh, and trying to find a super spreader event is, or trying to find the cause of the disease often comes down or is kind of linked with our own prejudices. And so this quote on the left is from Ambedkar. It's not really linked with migration, but it tells you in this particular village, and this is from the 1940s, that a particular woman was you know, burnt literally uh, uh, because she was assumed to be the cause of cholera in the village. Right? Now, the reason I'm putting this out, and the image on the right is about kind of, you know, disinfecting patients, but I put this image because many of you will recognize this image from what happened last year. When migrants went back home, many of them were hosed down. There's a sense of kind of, you know, purity literally attached to the body of the migrant worker coming back as a person who might be spreading diseases, even if the science you know, established in this case, for example, the image that you're seeing, there is simply no way that plague can be curtailed by what you're seeing in that image. They later found out that plague was a disease of rats, rat fleas, you know, transmission to humans, and you know, no amount of bathing like this would, would kind of save you from plague. It had a completely different transmission mechanism. But that didn't, of course, prevent people in 2020 from doing very similar things to migrant workers. There seemed to be a lot of hostility to migrant workers coming back. You know, villages in Bihar, for example, sealing themselves off completely to migrants from coming. And that's a huge problem in internal migration, which I'll come to in a little bit. It also is important to recognize that in a pandemic, we are all obsessed about this question, why is the pandemic hitting some parts of India or some parts of the world more than others? Last year, the class six talk answer of why the West was being hit more than India, we all had not let, I'm not going to say we. Many people had, you know, all sorts of crazy theories, and the biggest, the, the craziest theory, in my view, was some sense of natural immunity. That is, nothing happens to Indians, and this is only affecting the British and the Americans, and so on. Right. But we now know that all those cross-country variations can be explained to some extent by age, differing age profiles, by uh, better reporting standards, etc. I'm giving an example of plague out here. Plague did not affect all of India. Plague affected the Western Ghats and the Gangetic region more. It later turned out because of the nature of rats and rat fleas. It did not stop, of course, Eastern and Southern India celebrating good plague pandemic management. Right? And I say this because often today, we are very quick to point fingers, whether it is Uttar Pradesh, whether it's Kerala, whether it's Gujarat, whether it's Maharashtra, as to where the cases are happening a lot. And often, of course, Related with that is where are the migrants coming from and where are the migrants going to? Now, the learning from this is, of course, that it takes a lot of time to actually understand transmission. And even with COVID, we still don't know fully why COVID took so many more lives, for example, in the second wave in central India than others. Is it just the Delta wave outbreak epicenter? Is it humidity, as some scientists are now saying? We'll learn maybe in a few years, but to attribute now everything to good policy or you know, good luck uh, is, is, I think, a bit premature. We need to wait to understand really what is happening.
This is the case of plague. You'll see Madras presidency barely saw any plague, whereas Punjab was racked with plague for all those years. We also need to understand seasonality, and that is very important when we start talking about migration, because when we talk of migration and pandemics, in India, both are seasonal. You know, migration has a particular rhythm to it. Most migrants are home during the you know, uh, June, July season uh, in order to prepare their fields in terms of monsoon. And epidemics also tend to be seasonal. We still don't know the seasonality of COVID, whether it is seasonal or not. But disease in the past were. And so this is a chart of pandemics, uh, the plague pandemic. And you'll see that you know, plague basically disappeared as the monsoon came. Right? There was something about humidity levels that you know, affected plague. And that's an interesting way to look at COVID because the evidence on humidity and COVID is now increasingly becoming stronger and stronger. Now, what this means is that plague lasted in India for more than 20 years, but the response of migrants over time became very, very rational in the sense that they could understand when the high-risk months of plague were and accordingly make their migration decisions. And when plague was not, a, not at all a risk factor, and accordingly, it was safe then to migrate. Interestingly, in this time, the best way to beat plague between 1900 and 1910 was actually to evacuate. That is, if you were living in villages or small towns, the entire village or the small town would evacuate and live outside the town. Because there was something about living in the place with you know, rat uh, disease ecology that seemed to work with plague. And even the British acknowledged, this was, by the way, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, and it seemed to work. It seemed to work very effectively against plague. Uh, but the whole thing happened about seasonality uh, and, and that condition, then migration decisions uh, as well. There's a, there's a good literature on migration and the plague pandemic. The other thing that needs to be kept in mind during a pandemic is that you will get camps. Okay? You will get migration camps like we saw last year. You will get quarantine camps uh, to you know, uh, uh, maybe separate people who are infected from not. And it's very important to invest in good quality camps. Right? The reason is very simple. You not only enable a more orderly kind of stay of the people out there, because if, you, if they are completely mismanaged, people are going to run away. And if people are infected, they're going to spread the disease more you know, uh, away and away. I say this because last year when we had these camps, the migration camps, whether it was in Kerala, whether it was outside, it became so important. The camp managed became, became so important. And they, Kerala, in that sense, was a good model. Uh, I remember reading an article of uh, very interesting you know, ideas employed in Kerala where migrants were given carom boards, mobile phone chargers, and uh, you know, food from their home states kind of make them happy in the camps. Uh, whereas it, I, I was living in Gujarat and you know, people were just desperate to go back home and there was a brutal crush down on migrants out here. Worse, when people went back, for example, to Bihar last year, they were made to live in makeshift camps, which are completely atrocious. Uh, there's a good movie made, the, made, made on this now by Vinod Kapri. If some of you might want to see it, I think it's on Hotstar. But in that you know, video, that documentary tracks the migrants' journey back home. And you'll see what happens is when the people come back, they're made to live in atrocious camps, which is not only high disease, you know, it might not only amplify disease, but makes them more likely to run away and not uh, you know, keep to the quarantine protocols. Now, quarantine protocols are important in a public health crisis, but in order to do that, you need to have good camps. This is an image from the plague camp back then. And I'll come to a very significant point about you know, pandemic management. Uh, and that is the, you know, that you need to anticipate reverse migration. Uh, many people say, oh, it was unprecedented what happened last year. There's simply no way we could have known so many people wanted to go back and so on. That is complete humbug because, you know, anybody with the, even a basic idea of history of health and, you know, a migration in India. I mean, the reason I got into the subject of pandemics was because in my research on migration, I had come across so much material in different archives but how every time cholera broke out, how every time plague broke out, you know, people would run, people would run. Now, I'm pointing this particular image out, which is again, the railway station on Bombay, but I'm, I'm pointing out to this particular word used in the description, you know, special train. These are not just normal trains, these are special trains, much like what we did this last year when we arranged those shramic trains. But in my view, those trains came two months late. Now, this is a very important you know, policy choice. Do you send back migrants at the onset of a pan pandemic or do you try and contain the pandemic by not allowing migrants to go back? Note, the March 24 lockdown, national lockdown announced last year was very noble in its objective. The idea was to curtail the spread of the disease to rural areas, which as we know this year, 
can be you know very very fatal but at the same time it's lack of anticipation of what would happen to migrants you know meant that actually a lot of migrants anyway started moving in many cases walking and of course eventually it was simply not credible and the shramic trains had to start at a time when actually the infection risk was higher right so instead of sending back people in march we send them back in may when the infection rates were actually higher which in my view and i read in the op ed page uh, uh, you know in in march on that day itself uh, saying we need to send the migrants back home now now what's really fascinating for me is the british uh, approach to this now the british did a lot of mistakes in pandemic management uh, you know a lot of people died because of a variety of things which i chronicle in my book but on this thing they were in my view dead right the british actually reason that if they had to make the same policy choice should we shut down the indian railways or not and here's the big difference between international migration and internal migration while you can shut down international migration magically that is you just shut down your seaports or you shut down your airports you can't quite do that for internal mobility why because internal borders are much much more porous than international what we saw last year were people walking to state borders there were state border controls they would walk down a few kilometers cross over to the next state and complete their journey back right it's unlikely so what i'm trying to say is that for the migrant stuck in qatar for the migrant stuck in uk it's very unlikely that they were going to swim back to kerala or bombay right but for the migrant stuck in bangalore or delhi it was a completely feasible option to walk back to bihar that is a basic difference in the migration curtailment strategy it is much simpler to curtail international mobility than internal mobility and so the british in their wisdom actually documented this saying if we shut down the railways the migrants will anyway walk back home and that comes from this idea that india has a huge circular internal migration economy and if they are anyway going to walk back home or take other means of transport that is going to be much more you know without any coherence and that will arguably spread the disease in ways which is simply then not controllable and that is why they started these special trains right so what's really interesting to me is that this knowledge was there right we knew in a way i mean if if this knowledge was there and if the only reason i think you know this was knowledge was not there at the policy making level in march 2020 is because we do a very poor job in india in documenting history of many things but especially policy history right so that's why whenever i hear the word unprecedented uh, and that's by the way the reason i wrote this book on pandemics is that virtually none of the things we've seen in this pandemic is unprecedented in the sense that you'll find virtually everything including bodies floating on the ganga so i must say 1918 many more bodies floated on the ganga back then so this is very important i'm going to take this argument of migration and transport mechanisms to another level by looking at china in 1911 now in 1897 you know the british authorities did not shut down the railways we have an example from history where authorities actually shut down the railways for internal migrant workers and this happened in china during the 1911 plague outbreak in manchuria or there this is just an image of people fleeing and so on what do you think happened this was in january 1911 it led to a humanitarian crisis almost identical to what we saw in india last year in late march and april 2020 so we have two examples from history one in which we did not shut down the railways and arrange special trains for migrants to go back and another in which policy makers actually shut down railways and ruled that you know and so because january 1911 was winter a lot of these migrants actually died because of the cold just like many people last year were walking back in april which is peak summer and dying because of you know uh, heat and lack of food and stuff like that okay there's also good work now documenting migrant deaths last year it's it's you know i mean documented migrant deaths uh, now exceed you know more than 1000 or something uh, and of course we done documented we don't i'll come to the numbers of reverse migrants and so on in a bit but sometimes the disease can be so virulent that it overwhelms the entire population irrespective of the means of transport that is it really doesn't matter whether you have the railways or the roads diseases like the 1918 influenza pandemic or like the delta variant of this year can rip through populations irrespective of transport movements that is it is so virulent that even just a little bit of human kind of contact contagion is is you know is is conducive for this virus to spread now this paragraph i'm giving you is kind of a, a brief idea about the horrors of 1918 india's worst disaster the hospitals were choked some of us will remember what happened earlier this year so that it was impossible to remove the dead 
The streets and lanes were littered with dead. The postal and telegraph services were completely disorganized. The train service continued, but at all stations, dead and dying people were being removed from the trains. The burning ghats and the burial grounds were literally swamped with corpses, a scene seen in April and May earlier this year, while, you know, uh, uh, and everywhere, every household was lamenting a death and everywhere terror and confusion reigned. It kind of gives you a sense of the gravity of the 1918 influenza pandemic, but also tells you that sometimes pandemics, like I would argue this year's pandemic, can overwhelm, you know, just a population irrespective of transport. Because a huge part about pandemic management by curtailing migration is about which modes of transport and how do you really curtail match. It's, these are direct policy questions. Just a brief about the 1918 pandemic. You know, it came very quickly, just like this year's brutal second wave, All India second wave. Uh, April, you'll see, was the first wave. April, May, you'll see it's a very mild wave. The y-axis, by the way, is excess fever-related deaths using India's death statistics of those times. And each line out here is a district. The thick lines represent provinces. Uh, this comes from work by Siddharth Chandra and so on. I have my own work on this. It's in a separate uh, working paper. Um, and then November was the nightmare. You know, So all-cause mortality in India, you'll see the monthly all-cause mortality is pretty much flat for 20 years, and then it spikes up in 1918. This is exactly what happened this year uh, as well. And I'm going to show you those charts in a bit. In this case, about five times, you know, all cause mortality spiked by five times more. Uh, masks were hugely in, you know, vogue uh, back then, just as they are now. Uh, so, with that kind of blast from the past, I'm now going to move on to the kind of last segment out here, which is about what happened in the last one and a half years and what did we learn and, you know, what needs to be happening going forward. Now, I'll start with this proposition that every pandemic requires some migration in the sense that you cannot have a pandemic without migration. That is, if some people from Wuhan had not gone out, there would have been no pandemic. Right? So every pandemic, whether it was cholera, as long as there's a vector, uh, you could argue that in plague, you needed rat migration more than human migration. That's one way to look at it, but still some migration. There has been one scientist who argued that 1918 was so virulent that he speculated that it came from outer space and just dispersed across the atmosphere and was not human to human contagion. We now know that that's not true. Uh, there's good evidence that it was human to human contagion. So with that, what this means is that if you want to curtail a pandemic or you want to manage a pandemic, you have to curtail migration. There is simply no two ways about it. But the policy choices are when which type of migration do you want to curtail and how? Right? And this, these are the three burning policy questions. Right? And my brief take on these three things is when is you have your best shot at the onset of a pandemic, which is last year in, in, in uh, March. But what we should have done is to announce the special trains early on, like the British, and allow the migrant workers to go back, understand the seasonality of migration in India, uh, and you know, keep that in mind while doing that. Right. We were two months late last year on that. We were also late this year in having our localized restrictions. I'm going to show you some charts to that effect. Which type? I'm going to argue that you should be shutting down international migration, but you simply cannot, for pragmatic grounds, shut out internal migration completely. And that is why internal mobility has, needs to have a completely different orientation as compared to international migration. And how? So that's I'm going to come to that as well as to what are the policy options we have into how do we actually enact. So types of migration, just for those who have never thought about migration, though it's tough to do if you're based in Kerala, uh, broadly internal and international are two major types of migration. But in India, the way I see migration is typically in terms of duration. Most migration for work in India is temporary or semi-permanent, as I call it. Broadly temporary, less than six months, or semi-permanent, which is about 10 months in the year, and you know coming back for vacations or for the monsoon season. Uh, both of this together is called circular migration. And by some estimates, there are over 100 million circular migrant workers in India. Uh, even the census says there are 55 million plus you know, economic migrants. And that this was 2011 census. Uh, and of course, then there's permanent migration, which is much more long lasting. Now, th the pandemic is really interesting in the sense that it really hits circular migration very hard, right? Because people have a base in two locations. And when the pandemic comes, there's a curtailment of mobility, which means their lives are destroyed or distraught in any, in any case. For example, I'm a relatively more permanent migrant from Mumbai to Ahmedabad at this point. 
but the pandemic re really did not affect me in the sense that while i could not go back to mumbai or my you know my family could not really come we had the kind of holding power to get us through you know, salaried job the money is still coming in the bank it really doesn't affect but for circular migrant workers especially daily wage workers this was quite a big a lot of reasons for migration of course migration is usually selective uh, for work related reasons you know uh, male out migrants outnumber female migrants by a huge factor if you saw those images i showed you in the beginning many more men the shramik trains were almost completely male dominated by the way uh, last year uh, caste you know a lot of studies on this in general there is no selectivity on caste and out migration internal out migration but in shorter duration more vulnerable streams the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes are over represented and the converse happens at the longer duration migration ends uh, uh, religion also differs from place to place but the region is the most important aspect of migration in india uh, and people move of course for different reasons i'm going to quickly skip this slide but you know wage differentials pretty much being the, the the huge driver as to why people from say kerala go to the gulf but there are other non economic factors as well such as the anonymity of the city peer pressure and so on and of course there are push factors uh, distress natural disasters political turmoil and of course pandemics uh, which can also lead to reverse migration as we saw last year so with that i'm going to now briefly look at you know what happened in india in the last uh, one and a half years so let's start with international migration and i'm not going to talk about immigration because it's very tough to get real time data on immigration so i'm going to talk more about emigration uh, and so on. Uh, this is just a chart to tell you you know where indians are outside india uh, usa now has the highest number of indians outside india followed by you know uae saudi arabia and so on but the gulf as we know is a huge part of the nri imagination and so on and the chart on your right so there were 30 million strong diaspora uh, outside india and the chart on your right is from 2007 nss which tells you where remittances are flowing in as you know kerala gets a lot of remittances but so does punjab uh, so does you know goa and a lot of studies done from the cds migration research teams over the years which have kind of chronicled this uh, but this is just to give you a one shot glimpse about how international migration happens from india now what has been the impact of covid on indians outside india you know we're getting preliminary evidence now of starting evidence from from the gulf uh, first up it's not just livelihood losses but indians have also died outside india i think that's important to keep in mind despite the very young nature of the age profile this is data from kuwait uh, and you see you know the the red line is basically kuwaitis and the blue line is non kuwaitis so first point and it's a, it's a chart on death rates you see what's happened in 2020 the death rate spiked substantially right uh, i mean that's massive if you see what's happening it's a doubling of the death rate that's usually happening right now the blue line is much lower than the red line because the age profile is very different kuwaitis are young and old whereas non kuwaitis which are mostly indians and that's why i'm saying most non kuwaitis are indians uh most non kuwaitis not not only indians but they also very young i mean the you know the age profile is completely different that's why at a lower death rate but the spike is the same you know that's that spike that you're seeing in 2020 is so that's the first thing to note that you know a lot of indians people i think i'm not registered this but the the pandemic has been so devastating not only for indians in india but for indians also outside india right uh, especially in the gulf countries and so uh, this pandemic has been unique in the sense of the international closures which happened right so if you look at what's happened in economic growth around the world you know you look at past episodes like the great depression global income fell much more then you know it fell about 7% 6% in 2020 it fell about 17% during the great depression 1930s that's the chart on the left the chart on the right tells you about the economies with contraction in per capita gdp in no time in the last 150 years have so many economies collectively seen a recession right and so that obviously meant a huge spanner in international incomes across the world, right and that's something to keep in mind when we talk about international life. the second thing is of course that in 2020 international traffic dried out tremendously uh, uh much more by the way compared to internal traffic by and this is just air traffic right so if you look at passengers handled at international airports averaging at about 60 million in the previous years fell sharply to about 10 million right so international traffic because the airports were shut for most of 2020 uh, international airports and and so that so that's a 1/6 of the traffic that was experienced in 2020 2021 Uh, domestic traffic was not one sixth; it was slightly less than half. 
of course, and this is just you know air traffic, but we are seeing that of course internal mobility was hugely curtailed uh, uh, in in 2021 uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, this you can also see it in terms of dollar terms, travel receipts and travel payments you know fell drastically in 2021. I point this out because one of the industries which employs a fair amount of migrant labor in India is the tourism industry, and a lot of this travel gets reflected in the tourism stuff. Kerala, as you know, tourism industry has been hugely hit, uh, and this big fall that you're seeing between these two years, I'm putting it out there because, again, it's a huge impact on a sector which absorbs a lot of migrant workers in India. What's surprising, though, is that all of this has not really caused a major dent in remittances. Right? So international migration, despite switching it off, despite no doubt hardship for migrant workers, separated families, all the stuff that you know Kerala is especially going through, at the All India level, international remittances have Kind of held up fairly well, uh, in the sense that there's a drop, but it's a it's it's a it's a small drop, you know. So if you look at private transfer receipts, it drops from about I think 83 billion to about 80 billion dollars uh, 2021. These are still large flows, you know, 80 billion dollars as a percentage of overall GDP. Uh, and if you look at NRI deposits, outstanding, uh, actually saw an increase between 2020 and 2021, 21, right? March ending. Uh, so there was actually a net inflow into NRI deposits worth. Yeah, that talks back. I mean, this is still underexplored as to what's really happening because we are still waiting the complete breakdown on these statistics, especially where this money has come from. Could it be that more money has come from the US and less money has come from the Gulf? You know, we simply don't know enough. But overall, my sense is that you know, international migration, in terms of the economic hit to India at its macroeconomy, the hit has not been as large as many were suspecting initially on. Uh, and that could be because workers did not lose their jobs in such large numbers as uh, many people thought initially, because the, the kind of wiring to work from home happened quite quickly in the US and in the Gulf countries. So I now on to internal, internal migration. Uh, this is just a map to tell you where people move from in India. This is the hotspot of internal migration in India, or, you know, how people are moving away from. Uh, and you'll see you know, the red shaded districts are where percentage of houses with a migrant are more than you know, 20 percent uh, and so eastern UP Bihar you know Jharkhand Bihar Rajasthan and Kerala of course because people are going to the Gulf uh, so this is a map of both internal out migration as well as international out migration and a lot of this as I've argued in my book is what I call as the great Indian migration wave for many districts of India these migrations have been going on for more than a hundred years so this is not a new phenomenon in many of these districts and the circles represent more shorter term seasonal migration now what happened last year for one, India's lockdown was much more stringent than literally any other country in the world. Right? So we went in for the harshest option possible. This is a lockdown stringency index. And you'll see 100 is the most stringent and India is the green line. And you'll see how the green line shoots up in March, March 24th, and stays there for a long time as well. Right? And you'll see all other countries, including China, you know, were slightly less than India. Right? And as a result of that you know, extremely harsh lockdown, we of course not only you know got bought that time for you know the, the kids and and all the stuff that was supposed to happen during the lockdown, but we also of course created an unnecessary migration crisis. So what is the effect on mobility? Now I have over the last year been tracking this mobility and also assisting India's official government task force on you know how to basically think through mobility, uh, especially internal mobility. And this data comes from Google. Uh, Google, if you have a smartphone and the data on location is on, it captures that data. And broadly put, the blue districts, blue shaded districts, are where mobility for retail and recreation. So basically, this is measuring intra district mobility. Think of it almost as intra city mobility. Uh, if it goes less than 60, it means with respect to the baseline in Jan, Feb 2020, what is the percentage fall in mobility? Right. And so minus less than minus 60 means it's a state of an effective lockdown, right? massive shutdown. And this is what happened last year in last year's shutdown where virtually overnight, almost all districts, but you'll see even last year, state capacity differed. And so not all states could get their districts under complete lockdown, especially in Eastern UP and Bihar and so on. And you'll see that, you know, but it was quite quick. It was quite sudden, it was quite dramatic and India went into lockdown. Now what happened after that? By my estimates about, you know, total, 30 million people, or about 15 to 20% of the urban workforce, went back home. Uh, the government numbers are much smaller. So this is my kind of breakdown, what happened. There was a holy effect before the lockdown. 
there was a lockdown effect and then there was a shramik trains and you know variety of ways in which people so i was tracking those numbers very closely these are personal estimates these are obviously estimates uh, uh, but the government it's much more than what the government has put out the shramik trains we know you know transported about 5 to 6 million people uh, uh, last year uh, but that's only a small fraction of the overall so it was large it was unprecedented these are numbers which are larger than the partition movements right and the partition also played out over a long period of time this happened over two months this is india's biggest migration kind of exodus short term exodus which has happened uh, literally since you know 1947 uh, and it was deeply unfortunate okay uh, i'm going to skip this is about gujarat how we went about estimating this in gujarat uh, but just to give you a sense you know a lot of us who work on this were asked by different people tell us how many migrants are there so that you know we can arrange the buses we can arrange the trains a very logistic uh, logistics kind of requirement and i'm afraid to say that you know all of us got we were putting our numbers much more than the existing census and so on numbers but even then they fell short in the event you know we about 3 million people left gujarat alone when the census numbers for gujarat about you know 1 1 1/2 million uh, and we were estimating about 2.1 million or 2.5 million people in gujarat but about 3 million people left gujarat right so that's the also tells you about the kind of data the lack of real time data we have in india on migration and the problem it poses during a pandemic now uh, what do these people do as they return last year uh, by the government's own estimates about 1.14 crore that's about you know i mean my estimate is 31 million or 30 million the government's estimate the reported numbers by state governments is about 11 million people returned they returned mostly to up bihar as you can see the state shaded 3 million you know in up and so on the the, the kind of eastern india belt reported the most number of uh, people who returned Uh, even Kerala, by the way, uh, uh, reported some numbers. These are government reported. This was reported in Parliament uh, and so on. And this is Ministry of Labour and Employment. Of course, these are huge underestimates, but something to work with. Now, what did people do when they went back? Turns out that there were huge. At least a part of this reverse migration was reflected in massive uptake in India's, you know, the world's largest social security scheme, the Manrega. Right, and it should be stated out here that the Manrega was a massive shock absorber. of this massive dislocation that happened in india's labor market last and the counterfactual of no manrega would have been even more widespread poverty and distress right so there's no doubt that manrega really was important last year what's also important to note is that manrega was important during the first wave but during the second wave this year this data is up till may this year you don't see that much you'll see that the levels are still slightly more elevated than say pre pandemic levels but not that much and which also tells you that manrega was a short term shock absorber but in the end most people actually went back to the cities right and by september october we could see that reverse the reversal of the reverse exodus taking place okay these are numbers about how in the in the first wave and second wave first wave again just to point out you know the massive uptick broken by state in terms of a uh, uh, pre pandemic and post pandemic this is not my work this is work coming from uh, you know people uh, uh, some from other experts and the source is given out here but it it kind of very nicely tells you about what was happening in the labor market last year so coming back to this you know basic question why did so many people go back um and i think a lot of economists and you know people who work on migration have pointed out to the obvious which is if you don't have a job you want to go back as simple as that but i would point out to something more it was also about psychology it was also about the unique nature of circular migration in india there's also a cultural factor that is in india the same goes and this was by the way heard even more than 100 years back during the plague ki agar agar marna hai to gaon mein marenge it's a very powerful cultural kind of uh, element to migration that is if you want to die you'd rather die in the land of your birth uh, and that is i believe a reason why many people beyond a point even when you had economic security even when state governments were going all out giving rations there is only that much you can do and that is why this argument that if only we had done more in providing social security people will not go back home is deeply flawed in my view i do think we need to roll out all the social security but it is very naive to expect people to stay back uh, where you know uh, they are and not go back home during a major health crisis there is a larger cultural play out here again okay? that is why a lot of people as you remember also left kerala arguably the best state in terms of providing relief to those migrant workers last year but a lot of workers left kerala also last year uh coming back now to more to you know the first and second waves the differences and how do we see the migration impacts of that these are the reported numbers huge underestimates uh these are the more realistic you know picture of what happened this is andhra pradesh uh, 
massive all-cause mortality spike that you see. This is work from Rukmini, who you know first broke these numbers. But I wanted to focus on what happened in August, September as well. There was clearly excess mortality happening during the first wave as well in August, September last year, that is 2020. And of course, in May 2021, there's massive, massive spike that you see. Right? And we are saying that underreporting in Kerala is more in, in Andhra Pradesh is, is more than a factor of 20. Note again, all-cause mortality is spiking up by more than three or four times. This is exactly what we saw during 1918, right? And that is why I say COVID pandemic, the brutal COVID second wave of India is about as bad as the second wave of the 1918 uh, influenza. Not as much mortality, but in terms of all-cause mortality spike, you know, completely massive. This is our work. As I mentioned, we are working on estimating mortality. This is for a very limited data set from the HMIS. It has about less than 20%, it covers less than 20% of all deaths in usual times. But you see what's happening. You can clearly see the first wave uptick in 2020. You can see the massive uptick in April and May this year, right? And we don't have data for June, but by the way, even the June data is very, very large. In Tamil Nadu, for instance, the June data is much larger than others. And if you just look at the months April and May, you'll see that the biggest percentage excess was in Gujarat, where the death rate nearly tripled and the lowest was in Kerala. Though I won't put too much emphasis on the state level breakup that you're seeing here only because uh, uh you know only because uh, uh the june data is still awaited uh, and this is still a thin sample we still await a larger data set to understand state level variations but there's no doubt that kerala has seen less excess deaths than Gujarat. we can be very confident in in that uh, overall during the pandemic though of course kerala has had a lot of excess deaths in the last few months which is not there in gujarat uh, uh, you know, and so on but the, the numbers are just very stark uh, and it's also reflected in the seroprevalence surveys, much wider exposure in the pandemic, you know, in, in, in many of these states compared to, say, uh, Kerala. Now, this is important. Why? Because migrants in India are located in different states, and a lot of migrants were based in Gujarat, and a lot of migrants have died in this pandemic. So when I say 3 million people have died, unfortunately, I, I can't give you a split of how many are migrants and non-migrants, but there's no doubt that urban areas have been affected more, as you'll see in this chart. Uh, the urban spike, this is rural and urban, you know, split. Uh, you'll see that urban areas, the, the, the way to think about the pandemic and rural and urban differences is that the pandemic, the wave one was mostly an urban phenomenon and wave two was both rural and urban. This is intuitively true, but it is also borne out by the data. You'll see that wave one, you can see the wave one spike in the urban kind of scenario. You don't see that spike in the rural data, uh, but you see a massive spike, but you see a, in percentage terms, in both the waves, urban areas were much more hit than rural areas. And that is why a lot of migrant workers in our cities have also died in this pandemic. Now, to get a sense of what is happening on mobility restrictions uh, during the pandemic, I pointed out these are mobility scores coming from the Google mobility scores. Zero is pre-pandemic levels. The national lockdown last year shut down mobility across states, and you can see the score collapse across all states you know, uniformly. And then they kind of diverge across the next one year. But the difference between the 2020 and 2021 lockdowns was that the 2020 lockdowns was uniform, the 2021 was not. And in my view, many states reacted very late in the day to what was obviously a very, very violent outbreak, most likely starting from Eastern Maharashtra. Right? And so you can see that this you know, varied nature of the response kind of cost many of the states late in the pandemic, many states which were late to close unfortunately got much more of a wider spread and I think a much better job could have been done there. This is to give you a sense of how the mobility changed in India. April 1, most districts of India were at pre-pandemic levels of mobility. This is the phase of, I would say, hubris where people thought the pandemic is over. And you'll see a few districts in eastern Maharashtra where most likely the Delta variant broke out, uh, you know, uh, marked in blue. These were the first districts of India which went under lockdown. You can literally see the progression of the pandemic here proxied my mobility. Because as the pandemic spread from central Maharashtra, eastern Maharashtra, literally in a concentric circle across India, district after district and then state after state started imposing restrictions and eventually lockdowns. Right? But the puzzle is why some states were so late in the day to impose restrictions. Right? And of course, one part of that answer comes from elections. Uh, Tamil Nadu, for example, imposed restrictions only after the election process. Tamil Nadu has been badly hit in the pandemic. The June numbers make it very clear. Mobility restrictions could have been much better thought out and better done, I would argue, in the second wave. Though I must say that it's the national lockdown was not really warranted, like in the first year, but we could have been much smarter in the way we went about 
localized restrictions during the second. Uh, this is just to tell you the, the progression of the pandemic and May 20 was the peak where most districts of India had come under mobility restrictions and then started, you know, uh, uh, UPBR was the first out of the block in terms of opening out restrictions. So to kind of wrap up now, uh, you know, uh, every pandemic requires some migration and hence pandemic curtailment requires migration curtailment. Easier to do for international than internal, but how should internal migration be curtailed at the onset of a pandemic and during? One is policymakers need to really understand, uh, and so broad, more broadly put, in this life versus livelihoods debate, an important point that I want to make out here is that without some containment, both will be affected. Right? And 1918 is a classic point counterpoint to this. That is, 1918 you did not have massive lockdowns, and yet the economy took a beating of you know minus 10 percent. That is a massive mortality shock is also a massive economic shock, right? And that is why you need to have some containment. It is, you know, you have to balance this lives and livelihoods to a certain extent, okay? Uh, it's also important to recognize non-COVID excess deaths that happen uh, when these diseases, you know, uh, peak, like what happened in April and May. Uh, these are some containment strategies that we have proposed. It's there in the Lancet brief. Just, I'm not gonna go over this, but if anybody's interested in, into what we are thinking about in terms of when or how districts should close, uh, you know, there's stuff like that. And more broadly, in terms of policy options, what we're learning, uh, we have known this for the last 10, 20, 30 years, but it is worth restating. Uh, we are simply not prepared for the next pandemic or the next pandemic wave in terms of migration, uh, in terms of housing, because people are leaving housing, rental housing, because the contracts are not fixed or at least not, you know, uh, 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 most contracts are verbal. Uh, there's very little contract accountability, which means what we saw in the last wave was that the contractors were the first ones to leave, leaving employers and employees in the lurch. You know, so how do we get more contract accountability? So there's some kind of uh, thoughts on that. But on portability of social security, there's been some movement. We now have the One Nation, One Russian Card scheme. It has still yet to be you know, popularized, operationalized, and so on. But that's a step, in my view, in the right direction. There's also the eShram portal, which is coming on board. There's some logistic problems in that there's no doubt that if we actually manage to give migrant workers welfare access irrespective of your place of birth that goes a long way in addressing how to curtail uh, you know uh, uh, migration during a pandemic so i'll end here uh, pandemics and migrations are very closely linked very hard policy choices to make but in general you do not tinker with internal mobility as you can do with international mobility. And when you do tinker with internal mobility, you have to realize that the scale is large, that people will be affected in terms of livelihoods and hence social security measures have to be rolled out. Uh, and that uh, if you actually do curtail it very sharply, it will also blow back as we saw last year you know, in terms of migration camps uh, and so on. I'll end here with these stages of a pandemic as I call in my book, let's call it the social stages. That when a pandemic first comes, there's a lot of denial. Like March 2020 last year, a lot of people said, oh, nothing can happen to us. Then there's confusion. Then there's acceptance that, okay, we are stuck in this pandemic. But pandemics, unlike many other classes of mass mortality events, are also prone to erasure. We tend to forget pandemics remarkably quickly. Just think about 1918. How is it that we have forgotten India's worst demographic disaster in recorded history? And that is why it is very important to chronicle what happened in the last two years at state government levels, at union government levels, document best practices for migrant workers, what happened, what is the best way to run a migrant camp, what is the best way to send migrants back home. All of this has to be chronicled, documented, and come into some sort of a you know, pandemic management plan, because this is not the last pandemic that we're going to face. And the more we erase, the more we'll be in a very similar situation as we were last time around. So with that, I'll end. I run a Twitter and so Instagram handle on business and economic history. And also we run an internship in case students are interested in, on you know, uh, uh, history. Happy to interact with students. Uh, you, can, you can look this up online. So, so with that, I'll end. And thank you again for giving me this opportunity. If any questions, I'll be more than happy to take. Thank you very much. It was such a very important presentation. And it, uh, I like the way in which you use economic history very constructively to explain present trends. Now, the floor is open. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, you could just unmute yourself, ask the question, and uh, 
if you want to put that question in the chat box, uh, you could do that as well, and we will read that out for you. May I? Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tumbe, for uh, you know laying out such a wide canvas for us. My name is Prabina Kodot, and I've also been doing some work on migration. Um, I have two questions that are quite different um, in nature. Uh, the first really comes from that picture that you started with, uh, which was of the you know the migrants going back home. But the picture really centers a man with a child. And I'm just wondering about children in this whole context, children in the context of migration, children in the context of the pandemic and the two together. And what you could say, since you've you know, taken us through that wide sweep of history, what can you say as an observer from those two points, 1918 and now, where on how children are positioned? The second is, um, uh, you know, to kind of, uh, reverse the question that you asked about how, um, you know, that pandemics require migration. I would like to ask you, how do pandemics change migration in, in, in a really major way, in a structural sense, if, if it does at all, because you did towards the end say that uh, reverse, mi you know, return migration has occurred in, in a big way. So has it occurred in, in terms of really going back to the normal or to the pre-pandemic period, or has there been a change? That's with respect to internal migration. I also want to ask about international migration, how pandemics change uh, migration. And here I'm particularly interested in terms in uh, how uh, a pandemic may actually precipitate ongoing changes in such a way that it seems like a big change, but something was going on and it actually gives the opportunity to sort of embed those changes in a way that without the pandemic, it may have taken more time. So I'll end there. Thank you. Great. Um, th thanks for this. And I should start by saying that, uh, you know, you, you've not done some, you've done a lot of work on migration. Uh, you know, three great questions on children, on uh, pandemics, changing migration, and then on international migration. Uh, I'll start with the stuff on children. Uh, I should say, in in some way, uh, COVID nineteen is 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 a much better disease, so to speak, compared to many of these other pandemic diseases of the past, for the simple reason that it is very light on children in terms of its direct mortality impact. Right. So the most stylized fact, if there's one thing we know of the pandemic so far, at least, is the age gradient of this pandemic. That is, there's a perfect log linear relationship between age and death rates in, in the COVID pandemic, and the young are the least likely to be affected, especially that. This is not true of 1918. This is not true of cholera. This is not true of smallpox. This is not true of plague, uh, in which child mortality was substantial. And in 1918, this mortality signature was W-shaped, which means a lot of young kids died, a lot of people in the 20 to 40 age group died, a lot of old people died. That a kind of strange uh, logic. I'm saying that because in past pandemics, there was not only a migration impact, I'll talk about that in a bit, but there was a clear mortality impact on children. Right? And so the devastation was that much more. And 1918 was particularly brutal because it was a pandemic in which the age group 20 to 40, which was the most affected, right? and this is really bizarre. I mean, in the sense, most other pandemics, this is the age group which is the most well-suited to ride out the, the, the pandemic. Uh, and because the 20 to 8, 40 age group, you know, so many people died in India. What we got in India was massive number of orphans. So if you read the literature on 1980s, I'm discovering now, uh, no, no papers on this, but if you look at the newspaper reports of those times across, you know, different states of India, you go to the NMMM example, you know, often, everyone is talking about orphans. Because, so 1980 was undoubtedly a truly, you know, I mean, 20 million deaths is something else. Uh, but but the, the number of orphans in India was, was something else. Now, in this pandemic, also, we have the issue of orphans, not in the same scale. But I think that is the first the first order impact. That is the, the direct, and I think a lot of state governments have, you know, started giving financial packages to that. Uh, migration impact, one is, of course, child migrants who are working. Uh, you know, a huge toll taken on them. Often, they are the migrant carriers. So, a lot of, you know, images of the children carrying their 
you know, parent, I mean, I, I showed you an image of a you know, man carrying his small child, but they've also images of people 15 to 20 carrying their you know, parents and so on, or cycling them uh, behind. So a lot of kind of burden uh, taken that. Uh, but biggest impact, of course, is on mental health. Uh, and uh, in the past, also, people were concerned about mental health, but it's not a professional field as, as, as it is much more uh, now. Uh, and that, I think in India, I mean, it's, it's tough to say how much more of it is among migrant children versus, say, non-migrant children, uh, because non-migrant children after the second wave have also been you know, badly affected. And pretty much all children in India have been affected by this out-of-school kind of uh, in that sense, in a very strange way, the pandemic has equalized. Earlier, when children would go out with their parents, those children, uh, uh, you know, they would be the ones out of school. Uh, in a way, now because schooling has shut pretty much everywhere, even those parents who would otherwise not take their kids, or the kids whose parents were always there, even they are effectively out of school, especially if you don't have digital platforms and so on. So, in a very strange and twisted way, the pandemic has also leveled off, taking out education from everyone rather than earlier just selectively taking it among, you know, migrant children. That's another way, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this whole thing about uh, migration and children. Again, the numbers are very hard to come by in terms of how many children did the reverse exodus last year. Uh, obviously, they were, you know, uh, a substantial, but it's, it's really tough to get any idea uh, of that. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, so that, that's a broad thing. The mortality impact has been very light in this pandemic. The livelihood impact, the last point I'll say is that a lot of children, the, the general livelihood distress means that there's no doubt that child labor has gone up, right? Uh, and we've seen that in 1918, you know, child labor just spectacularly, the 1921 census registered this huge ups, uptick in, in child labor. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I have a lot of quotes in my book on you know, what the, people in 1918 were just concerned all the time with what do we do with people who don't have parents. You know, so thankfully, we don't have that big a disaster, demographic disaster in 1918. Uh, uh, but but I think some of those concerns are, are still there. Now, how do pandemics change migration? Uh, does it change the, let me put this in, in very India-specific context because that's pretty much what uh, I've been working on. My sense of Indian migration over the last 130 years is that very rarely do source regions change. Very rarely do shocks to the source region alter source region migration. That is, it's very rare for a district with a lot of out-migration to see that out-migration fall apart from a reason such as declining fertility or a demographic kind of thing. Which means that the only, re what, what changes is not the source region, but the destination. Right? So what you would expect, what I, I think the pandemic might, may change is migration corridors from the same source regions, but different destinations. And that can happen in terms of internal migration uh, for an added reason that a lot of migrants have been shortchanged by the cities they were working in. Uh, I know anecdotally, at least, that you know, a lot of migrants said, we will never come back to Surat or never come back to Delhi, never come back to Ahmedabad. You know, that kind of a, 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 an idea that the city has shortchanged you or the government has shortchanged you. But the impetus to migrate is so large in India. Uh, the wage differentials are large and for all we know, growing. Uh, that the epicenter, which is Eastern India, that hinterland belt, that migration is not going to stop. It is going to grow, but it could divert. It could, maybe this migration is inflection point where more migrants seek greener pastures southwards. That's which we've already been documenting happening over the last 20 years. Maybe it will intensify that, you know, uh, going forward. Because I, I do think there was initially in last year when as the people are going back, a lot of talk saying, oh, these people will never come back, which I knew from the history is simply not true. Even when the British had arranged those special trains in January, February, you know, 1897, by the end of the year, they were back. You know, 400,000 people left Bombay. Bombay's population was 800,000. Half of Bombay left, and they came back by the end of the year. So it was never going to be a permanent exodus. But there are definitely a few people who are, who, for whom the pandemic has, you know, thought that, you know, should we really migrate if the risks are so large? So I don't think migration is going to fundamentally alter India's rural urban migration volumes. If at all anything, it will you know, affect uh, uh, migration corridors where new destinations emerge from the same source region. Uh, the question of international migration, were there any trends that we were seeing? At least for the last 10 years, at least from India, it was fairly flat in the sense the same stuff about 
40 to 50 percent going to Gulf, 30 percent US, you know, the rest to Europe, Punjab to Italy. I mean, those trends were pretty much there. I think if you look at India's international migration history in the you know last 50 years, uh, the first big change to trend came from 70s, 80s, 90s, which is the Gulf story. Then from the 80, from the 90s and 2000s, really the US story. And then maybe along the way, Australia and Canada have come up in the high scale migration story. Now, will the pandemic fundamentally change this? Uh, there are a couple of ways to look at this. Uh, one is, of course, that the mortality, Western countries, the major absorbers of migrants have been badly hit, uh, whether it's US, uh, whether it is you know, Europe, and so on. Now, badly hit in what ways? They've been badly hit in mortality, right? That is, a lot of people have died, uh, and a lot of old people have died. Uh, but that is also means that uh, uh, a lot of people in the labor market have also died. That also means that there's a shortage of labor in many of those key sectors. And they also know that they're going to have to place a huge emphasis on health, even more than what they were doing going forward. Which means that there is an opportunity for many key sectors uh, uh, to migrate in these economies, especially as they're looking for more growth going forward. The flip side is that because these countries are getting out of a recession, there is also some unemployment, which means you still are going to see a lot of protectionist measures in place for at least a few years. So it's a it's a it's a tussle between the the demand for labor, which is clearly going to be there in the coming decade, versus uh, protectionist sentiments as of now. Uh, but I do think the general you know, movement from India to Europe, U.S., Gulf uh, will fundamentally continue. And what we're seeing from the Gulf story is very interesting. Uh, you know. The global financial crisis did not alter too much. Will the pandemic alter it fundamentally? You know, I think Professor Rajan says we need to do a survey on Kerala to really understand the latest thing. I think that's a good idea. But if you look at the remittance numbers, if you look at some of these other numbers, it seems to be still fairly resilient. So the Kerala Gulf, India Gulf connection seems to be, you know, remarkably resilient. Uh, it might change purely out of demographics. The Kerala's plummeting birth rate means immigration pressures you know, ease off in the coming decades. And that might be a natural way in which migration from Kerala to Gulf diminishes. But whether the Gulf will actively, countries in the Gulf will actively block out migrants and so on, I don't think so at all. And I think what both the crises have shown is that now the Gulf economy is so intertwined with the economy of the migrant labor, which means Indians are not only migrants, but also consumers in the Gulf. That is without the Indians, you know, even their economies, uh, will not work in in many of the uh, sort of uh, service sector uh, zones. So there's a there's a kind of symbiotic relationship, which means that even the protectionist measures that come out there, if you see, you know the 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 protectionist laws of Saudi Arabia and so on, we we've, we've seen the rhetoric just like we see internal mi migration rhetoric in India protectionism. We've seen this now for more than ten years. It has not stopped down Indian migration into the Gulf or for that matter. Uh, but I'm estimating about two millions Indian, about on an average about one and a half to two million Indians leaving India every year just before the pandemic. If you just look at air traffic, net traffic. Now that of course ended in 2020 when very few Indians moved across. Uh, but as air traffic resumes, it will be slow, but it, it might not be one, one and a half, two million as you know uh, the numbers were showing in 2016, 17, uh, but it will pick up. Uh, and so short answer to your uh, question, is that uh, the broad pressures for international migration stay on. Uh, and at least for India, the principal destinations, which is US and you know, Gulf, uh, will not change uh, that much. And that's why, you know, uh, and, and for that matter, healthcare as a sector uh, will also see huge demand across the world. And since, you know, uh, we have some competency out there, we can expect to see more migration actually in those, in those sectors. Thank you. Uh, actually, the, there are two more questions, one in the chat box and uh, the other one is from, from uh, Professor Santosh Mehrotva. So I will read out the question from Sratha Jain in the chat box. Okay, and she Sratha says one of the main differences with the current pandemic are developments related to medicine. Uh, what do we learn about access to treatment from past pandemics? Secondly, have pandemics given rise to new market practices? To new market practices? Yes, that's right. In healthcare or in general? Uh, Sridhar, is it healthcare or in uh, I, I suppose uh, healthcare? 
Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it, you know, I mean, it, it, maybe not entirely, you know, a question linked with migration per se, uh, but uh, uh, because I've you know done this thing on past pandemics, uh, there is a lot of hubris uh, among human beings in general that we are a better place today than pandemics in the past. And I think we need to get over this. Uh, and I'll give you the example of 1917, the year before the influenza. Between 1860 and 1917, the world experienced the bacteriological revolution. You know, you have stars like Robert Koch, Louis Pasteur. In, I mean, in fantastic discoveries, the cholera vaccine, the plague vaccine had come about. Uh, and by 1917, people thought they had done a good job. Death rates had started plummeting in Europe and so on. Cholera was under control. They had figured out plague. They had figured out uh, even you know stuff like tuberculosis and so on. And then came 1918, and 40 million humans were wiped out. Right now, when this pandemic started in March 2020, you know I tweeted something on 1918 influenza in India and why we should remember it. And the comments I got was, "Oh, nothing like that can happen today." Well, nothing like that better happen today, you know, 20 million deaths, but we are in quite a bad state. 3 million deaths is not a joke. And that is why, you know, I keep saying that this idea that modern science has developed has, I mean, it developed a lot between 1860 and 1917, but you still got 1918. And so there's nothing really to say that, you know, a pandemic uh, cannot literally, you know, uh, destroy a huge part of the human race in the future. One always has to be on guard and one has to invest a lot in understanding the disease, huge, and a lot of that has been done in the last month. And a specific question on access to treatments. Uh, the way I look at this, I'll kind of build on this in two parts. There's no doubt that more people have access to treatments and so on today. And so if you think about people who had, and there's no doubt that as I've in my book in 1918, a lot of people died simply because they were undernourished, malnourished, there was a drought net here, you know, there's an interaction going on. This year, you know, we don't have all those things and people do have better treatments. But in a pandemic, you'll see very quickly, as we saw in April and May, even when you have some treatments, you you know, you know get black markets, the treatments, uh, the supplies dwindle, there's hoarding, and a lot of times people die simply because they don't have access to medicine or they give them the wrong treatments. And that's why you need to have good organization. You'll, what is surprising was so many medicines pulled off after they were recommended for a few weeks you know, earlier on of this year. But the way I'd like to you know, answer your questions in terms of rural urban differences. In 1918 and now, what's really common is how the pandemic affects rural areas and urban areas, right? When you think of a pandemic and how it affects these two places differently, pandemics are much more deadly for urban areas because of higher density, but they're much more deadly for rural areas because of relative lack of access to healthcare or good quality health, right? So if you're living in a city, higher chance of getting the disease because of more density, typically in most diseases, but you also have access to good healthcare. And in a village, maybe a bit more remote, less likely to get the disease, but if you get the disease, then you're a bit stuck. So th there's a kind of pros and cons of the urban and rural areas. Now in 1918, rural India was much more hit than urban India. In fact, it's the only year where rural death rates were higher than urban de death rates in the early 20th century in India. This time around, as I showed you, urban India saw a much larger death spike in both wave one and wave two, but there's no doubt that in wave two, it was aggravated in rural areas precisely because of lack of healthcare. And not just an access to treatment, which is a specific question, lack of access to testing. You know, a lot of these numbers that we are seeing is still even today a function of testing capacity, right? And you, know, you just look at the map of the testing labs in India that tells you where the reported cases are coming from. When I say that, you know, Andhra Pradesh has lost more than 100,000 people, whereas the reported COVID numbers, you know, are something like 5,000 or something. That tells you that a lot of people simply could not even get tested in time before they died. They did not even know that they were, you know, arguably, be, uh, you know, dying of COVID. So I don't think in that sense, you know, access to treatment was uh, phenomenally greater in that sense Obviously, few, much fewer people have died so far on a per capita basis compared to 1918. But the thing with pandemics is that it overwhelms systems very quickly. So that even if in theory you have a lot of equipment supplies in place, in that panic, in that you know, few weeks window, like in November 1918 or like in April, May this year, things can go completely out of whack. Right? And a lot of people end up dying uh, when uh, they should not. Uh, your thing about new market practices, uh, I mean, it's a logic question. We know what has happened in this pandemic. Uh, 
the fact that we're having this, you know, me uh, meeting online rather than offline, that has fundamentally changed the world forever in terms of how we engage with each other. We are going to be doing much more online stuff than any time in the past. And that shift has been hugely done by the pandemic. To give you a sense of, you know, demonetization, a lot of people say demonetization, you know, after it was rolled out, they shifted the goalpost to increasing financial inclusion, digital payments, and so on. There's no doubt that digital payments increased. But if you look at the chart on digital payments in India, the break point is not demonetization, it's the pandemic, right? So what is really, so that has been a huge disruption across sectors in this pandemic. Now that affects healthcare in the way you see how telemedicine is picking up massively. So that is really the pandemic impact. That is the, lock, the coordinated lockdowns across the world have forced us into the online medium for more than a year. And that has kind of completely changed the way we do pretty much everything. And that's going to stay on. So migration, I'm saying, won't change so much in the sense people will still move from villages to cities. And they're not going to work online from villages. As I pointed out, most jobs in India cannot be done from home. But there'll be that much more stuff which is being done online uh, than in the past. Uh, maybe not satisfactory answers to your to your questions, uh, but you know that's that's my brief response. Thank you. Uh, now Santosh could ask his question. Thank you, Dr. Tumbe, and th thank you, Dr. Mani, for organizing this very useful presentation. Uh, Dr. Tumbe, I, you may have addressed the issue I'm about to ask, because I'm, and I'm, I apologize for having joined late, but let me nevertheless ask the question. I'm trying to assess what the size and scale of the reverse migration was from urban to rural areas. Um, I have examined uh, the labor force survey data, the PLFS data in 2019-20, which comes up to June of 2020. And compared to the PLFS of 1819, I find this shocking increase in the absolute number of workers in agriculture. Of course, we all know that there was a massive shift towards uh, work in agriculture because of this reverse migration that took place on account of the pandemic. But I'm trying to assess what the size was. And I was absolutely stunned to find that the increase in the number of workers in agriculture is, is between 1819 and 1920 was as much as 32 million. It goes up from just under 200 million to 232 million workers in agriculture. Um, now, I know that a lot of women rejoined agriculture over the course of that this, this year for reasons I won't go into, but the, is there, do you have some better a uh, sense of or are there sources of other than the administrative sources, which no, I, I doubt if any of one, any one of us trusts, uh, of what the size and scale was, at least in the first wave. Um, we we sim simply don't have any, uh, unless we begin to use the CMIE data, which I do plan to, to look at what the impact of, or in terms of reverse migration was in the second wave. Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, yeah, I think you might have, because I did have a few slides on it and I'll go go, 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 go through that again. Uh, but broadly, my numbers are 30 million, which is pretty much exactly the difference between 230 and 200, but that's just a coincidence. Uh, uh, so let me just show that uh, particular chart. Right, so can you see this? Yeah. Right, so this is my breakdown. Now, this is not from administrative data. This is not from anything. This is purely out of gut instinct, looking at daily data. I was tracking this, you know, every day for those uh, few months and so on. Uh, and so we kind of have some idea of how many people go back for Holi. This is using railway statistics for the economic survey 2016-17. And so even before the lockdown was initiated, actually some people... Before the lockdown was initiated, actually some people... Are... Sorry, so some people had already gone back. Uh, this is a bit like the Chinese reverse migration. You know, every year, lunar uh, holiday, uh, this lunar New Year holiday in January, hundreds of millions of people in China take the train and go back home. And this year, they made that journey, and then the lockdown was instituted. So a lot of people had gone back before the lockdown actually in China. It's one of the reasons how China actually got lucky. Uh, <clears throat> then you had this March 25th to April 30th, uh, where I estimate about five million. And this is again very kind of conservative a lot of this was also you know in interest rate this is picking up from again newspaper reports variety of newspaper reports and so on but the government figures were you know uh, six 
six flat, whatever. Uh, and then you have the the main like you know phase where, uh, where a lot of people because transport options started then in in the month of May last year, uh, and then I estimate about twenty million return. And the official number for shramik trains is about six million, five million till May twenty seventh, and so. On. Uh, so the official numbers, by the way, so my numbers are 30 million. The official numbers reported to the state governments is 1.14 crore or 11 million, right? So my estimate is 30 million, uh, uh, but my estimates in a way is, is, is also, you know, counting a bit of intrastate movement and so on. But this is pretty much interstate mobility as admitted by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. And this might be a useful way for you actually to look at it because these numbers are now there. Uh, and it tells you state-wise, you know, how many people returned uh, and so on. And you're right that there's a huge pickup in the PLFS, and it's also noted in Manrega. Uh, uh, so I don't know if how it's treated in the PLFS, but, you know, there's clearly this massive spike that you're seeing. I mean, you can just look at this jump. You know, it's a doubling. Just look at what's happening in April, May, June. It's a doubling of uh, this, uh, this thing. So a couple of ways to get around this, see how many people are working in Manrega, because that was a shock, shock absorber. Uh, uh, have a look at the Ministry of Labor and Employment numbers, how many migrant workers went by state. I think that this, this kind of number is useful, not for the absolute number, which I think is much more than 11 million, but maybe just in terms of the state ordering. And if you can, if you can see this percentage jump, you know, which is actually in this chart out here, the percent, this is on Mandrega percentage jump. But if you see this, if these percentages or these numbers, state ranking matches with what you're seeing in the PLFS, that is one way to corroborate the story that you're just seeing precisely in UP, for example, you know, agriculture is going up and you're seeing out here UK, UP, a lot of people are going back. I think that's one way to corroborate the PLFS story with what's happening from the Ministry of Labor. But there's no doubt that the numbers are very, very large and is being picked up by a variety of data sets. As I showed you, Ministry of Labor and Employment, Mandrega, and as you said, you know, PLFS. I'm pretty sure the CMI also does this. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm sure there are also studies on migration CMI. Uh, uh, I've not really come across that uh, yet, but there's no doubt that this is, especially for you know migration researchers. I'm sure many of you are working on migration as students, faculty, and so on. Uh, that we still need a much better understanding of uh, you know of what exactly happened during this wave, uh, both the waves, first wave, second wave, and so on. Uh, we know that there was a massive hit. Of course, yeah. Thank you. I think our, uh, we will have the last question from Dr. Ravi Raman. Uh, he wants to, he's seeking a clarification. Yeah, yeah. The, thanks, uh, Professor Sunil. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Tunde. I mean, for your uh, superb studies and also for your enlightening presentation. And we are so grateful to you. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm asking the right question. Uh, if it is not so, sorry about that. Um, I wonder whether there is one missing element in, in the whole presentation, uh, particularly when you place the whole thing in, in, in terms of economics and uh, psychology, you know. Uh, the point that I'm trying to raise is the, the, uh, the kind of contradictions that one would find in the, in the uh, emerging nature of Indian states. Indian state in itself and also the uh, Indian subnational states, uh, and and in what way that one could understand the kind of pandemics and its and its precarity, you know, in terms of the nature of the state that is emerging. I mean, what I mean to say is this: I mean, if you look at uh, the vaccination policy, for instance, it was heavily biased, you know, it was heavily biased to the corporate sector. If you take the case of the violation of labor law laws in various states, the Rajasthan. Andhra Pradesh and in some other states. Again, it was heavily biased to what is called the corporate capital and the real estate lobbies. So I wonder uh, whether whether we need to incorporate the the cultural political economy aspects also, apart from the kind of things that you raised in terms of economics and psychology. This is particularly important when you when you go for your trade off between lives and livelihoods. You know. As far as the state is concerned or the corporate capital is concerned, it's again a trade off between the protection of its population and the protection of its economies, the latter driven by the corporate capital. So what I mean to say is that to what extent we could bring in the, the question of the emerging nature of states and its character and in what way the 
the, the, the depth of this pandemic could be explained in terms of the nature of the state power in India. Yeah, thanks. This is a you know great comment. Uh, again, I you know, given given my exposure to economic history and the of long duration view, uh, uh, pandemics are strange things, and they do strange things to the labor market. Often, pandemics can have surprisingly uh, uh, useful things for labor power. You know, after the pandemic, uh, in my book, I point out how 1918 was the inflection point uh, in India's labor movement, even more than 1917, the Russian Revolution. It was 1918, and the fact that 6% of, well, more than 6% of India's labor supply was wiped out, increased bargaining power of workers, uh, and, and really led to massive labor movements in the 1920s. And you know, I write a lot about uh, uh, that. Uh, we have examples from the plague where the textile mills, when, as I said, you know, half of Bombay was emptied out. The mills start, te textile mills of Bombay had to start giving bonuses. There's a whole paper on this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, basically, pandemics have historically also altered the bargaining power between labor and capital. Now, we are in a pandemic in which the demographic shock, as I said, has been large, but not very large in per capita terms. It's not 6%, it's point something percent of the population, though it differs from place to place. In I know places in Gujarat where districts have lost about 1% of the population, which is a very large number. Uh, so the way in which capital labor, state capital labor relations, you know, change in a pandemic, I think are quite interesting. For a brief moment last year, you know, when the migrants went back, you know, that was a classic example of, you know, a, a, a failure of state imagination in thinking about migrant workers. And right? that is how, in a way, the crisis can be uh, conceptualized. But in a strange way, because a lot of these jobs were held in urban areas, for a period of time between, say, August and October last year, there was also tremendous bargaining power of migrant workers as they came back to cities. So workers or employees would, you know, uh, say, oh, you want to come by plane? Basically a pampering saying, please come back. We need you to, right? That, by the way, that attitude I know of among, you know, various uh, associations has persisted over time. So it's not all, you know, uh, bad in the sense that some employers have also woken up to the reality of migrant workers and have realized that, look, so what is the difference between the first wave and second wave? In the second wave, a lot of employees, employers also learned that we simply can't let our workers, you know, left in the lurch, otherwise they're going to go back again. So purely from a business and commercial point of view, you know, they started investing a bit in terms of workers' welfare. I'm saying it's not everywhere, but, you know, at least uh, many of the bodies which I've been talking to uh, have enacted that. On vaccination, you know, you mentioned corporate, uh, you know, bias, absolutely. It should have always been a public and pure public health response. But the fact is that a lot of employers, our organization, for instance, uh, you know, have vaccinated pretty much everyone on our campus, for example, including migrant workers and so on. And so that initiative has also come. More broadly, I think the pandemic has also, you know, in a very twisted manner, uh, visibilized a hugely invisible class of workers until, until now, right? So it's, the way I look at it this way, that yes, the migration crisis reflects what you precisely said, the precarity of labor, the fact that it was never in our political imagination. But I do think, and I'm hopeful, that precisely because we got a migration crisis, there are a lot of people who had never thought of migrant workers, who never knew the scale, who had never really, it was literally a crisis which shook up people and said, okay, you know, maybe we ought to do something. And so in that sense, you know, you might just see a change in attitudes from corporates, from uh, many of these other constituencies towards migrants. I know politicians, you know, I've talked to parliamentarians on this topic. Politicians across India are very concerned about how, what do we do for migrant workers? Uh, so, so there's clearly now, you know, this, this growing interest in, in this field. Will things change? I think that eventually only time will tell. Uh, but, you know, uh, to, to say that, you know, it, things will necessarily get worse from it. I think this was the low point in India's overall treatment of migrant workers, hopefully the low point. Uh, and from now on, some positive steps have also taken place. I think this Ishram portal is a good step, as I said, one nation, one Russian, and so on. But more generally, employers need to know who is working for them. And that's why I've had that point about contractor accountability. Uh, and things. So the larger point, you know, should one factor the political economy in pretty much any issue? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. Uh, uh, but the, the way, you know, I mean, because I've seen so many responses to the pandemic, I am, I am not 
very convinced about a overly kind of you know pessimistic view that the pandemic has you know uh, yes it, because as somebody working on this for more than 10 years now you know and also working on history i mean you know indian labor has has been in a way always precariously placed for more than 100 years now uh, i think there are also some good points which we should kind of build on uh, and see now you know how do we make life for the migrant worker uh, much much better that requires interstate coordination which collapsed spectacularly last year i think that's an important point about this political economy you know you had people from gujarat who wanted to go to bihar the bihar government saying please don't take you know we are not going to take them back literally you know what you get in the international migration crisis uh, happening at the internal level uh, and so on so those things you know definitely need to be resolved uh, maybe we need to have some sort of a like we have the goods and services council goods and service tax council which is for the movement of goods and services uh, and and variety of issues related to that uh, maybe it's high time we also have a council to look at interstate movement of people uh, and to that would enable a real time estimate of how many people are there across states we were lacking in that during this crisis and that was a huge deficiency in terms of planning and management last year uh, that might also enable dispute resolution uh, uh, and so on uh, so these are maybe some of the ways in which one might uh, you know make these things work better uh, but your point is well taken thank you so much okay uh, thank you very much uh, i think uh, now it's uh, 5 to 21 minutes past 5 pm uh, and i thank uh, Dr. Chinmay Tumbe for such a wonderful lecture and also your patience in answering all the questions very elaborately. Uh, thank you so much. And as I said before, uh, I, we look forward to having you visit us uh, when things are, uh, when you are able to migrate to, to Manipur. Okay. And I also thank uh, the family of uh, Dr. P.K. Gopalakrishnan, specifically Dr. Leta, who is with us uh, throughout the lecture. And I thank each one of you for sparing your valuable time. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Lopez. Thank you so much. So I'm ending the call now.